we head towards the seventh chapter of Hornbill. And the name says The Adventure. Now, just as the name suggests, this is an adventurous story. It's a little complicated stuff. So let's go for it. Written by Jayanth Narlikar. Now let's see what is the adventure that we are all going to go through. But before that, let's know about the author. Jayanth Vishnu Narlikar was born in Kolhapur, Maharashtra to a well-known mathematician, Vishnu Narlikar and a Sanskrit scholar, Sumita Narlikar. So he had a very good educational background. He went to Cambridge University in 1957. He has received Smith's Prize and Adams Prize. In 1972, he became a professor at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. He received the SS Bhatnagar Award for Physical Sciences and FIE, we know the fellowship, right? Foundation Rashtrabhushan Award in 1981. So yeah, a very scholarly person. Now let's see the adventure he has woven for us. So let's get to the plot of the story. See if you can understand even a little bit. If not, just keep following me. Just keep watching the video and enjoy the adventure. The adventure belongs to the science fiction genre. It is really based on science fiction. Professor Gangadhar Pant Gaitonde. Now he is the protagonist. He is the hero of the story. Finds himself in a strange world. Strange world? Well, we'll see how strange it was. No doubt he is in Pune, but the facts do not agree with history. He is in Pune, but he feels he's not in Pune because what the scenario around is something different as per the history he knows. He decides to go to Bombay and consult history books. Let me tell you, he himself is a historian. Yeah, a lot of history. He's all about it. So that's where he excels. That's his special subject, the main subject. Bombay is not what he expected to find it. Now he goes to Bombay, same thing. He goes to Bombay and he realizes this is not the Bombay I know. East India Company is still ruling there. You know the East India Company, the uh, you know when the British had done uh, business and they had brought up uh, in India, the East India Company with that name they had come. According to the history known to him, the East India Company was wound up just after the events of 1857. Now as for the history he knows, because being a historian, obviously he knows the facts. So he's saying, to what I know, the East India Company had shut after 1857. So now if I have gone there and I can still see East India Company, now that's a little strange. He goes to the library and finds the answer. Now he wants to know where is he, what is going on, why is it so strange? The events took a different course after the battle of Panipat, the Marathas had won the battle, not lost it. Well, we go a little deeper in this along with the chapter. So let's move on to find out more. The Jijamata Express sped along the Pune-Bombay route considerably faster than the Deccan Queen. Now here what you are reading, the Jijamata Express, the Deccan Queen, these are the names of the trains. Yeah. So they are going like uh, Bombay, uh, sorry, Pune to Bombay. That's the route they go. So Jija Mata is going faster than the Deccan Queen. There were no industrial townships outside Pune. Now he is going there, right? Now, one important thing, let me tell you a little, uh, uh, let me give you a little, uh, what do you say, a little background of the story. So like I told you, he was a historian and somewhere he has collided he's met with an accident his car has you know collided has banged against the truck and at that point of time his mental status as in nothing really happened but what happened was he went he was in the present but in a different world complicated right yes it is that's how it is the adventurous story he was in the present moment but he was there in two different worlds. The actual world which he was there and this little world where he went into coma for two days, he went to a different world at the same time, right? Because he was in coma, so he was elsewhere. 
right so this is how now this what you are reading right now is those two days of coma this is what was happening in his new world yeah the very strange world so he is going by these trains and he's saying there were no industrial townships outside Pune. How is that possible? What are industrial townships? City where the economic system is based on the industry. How is that possible? So yeah, then it wasn't there. But yeah, currently we all know the situation. The first stop, Lanavla, came in 40 minutes. The Ghat section that followed was no different from what he knew. The Ghat, you know, the range of stepped hills with valleys. You know, when we go, uh, you know, Pune, Bombay, we go through the Western Ghat. Yeah. So this is all about it. So he's saying those Ghats, what I knew about the Ghats, it was the same. That was not different. It was all the same. The train stopped at Karjat only briefly, just for a few minutes and went on at even greater speed. After stopping at Karjat, it went still faster. It rode through Kalyan. Now that's the route, you know, from Pune to Bombay. It rode as in it moved with loud sounds. It was the engine kept, you know, honking and it was roaring with and speeding. Meanwhile, the racing mind of Professor Gaitonde had arrived at a plan of action in Bombay. Now, because he was a historian, there was a lot of planning involved. Always, uh, you know, some sort of planning going on in his mind. So, what he did was, while he was sitting in the train, he said, okay, now let me think of what am I going to do in Mumbai. Let me plan it out. So, there was a plan of action. Indeed, as a historian an expert or a student of history, he felt he should have thought of it sooner. He says, come on, being a historian, like, you know, I should have done this way before. I should have made my plan way before, but I didn't, which is wrong. He would go to a big library and browse through history books. Now, historian, again, so obviously in love with the history books. So he said, I'll definitely go to the library and, you know, go through those history books. Maybe there is something different, something, you know, for me to solve this puzzle that's going on. There's a different, uh, you know, there are no townships and I'm seeing something different. I need to understand history. Maybe I am mistaken or what is the scene? So I need to visit and read those books to find out where, what is going on. Why is everything so strange currently? That was the surest way of finding out how the present state of affairs was reached. So now that when you read the books, when you get to know about all the history, how it went, you know, how the whole procedure was, that is where you will know that the current state of affairs, whatever has happened presently, how did it reach there? What had happened? So that was the best way to find out going through the history books. Now, he also planned eventually to return to Pune and have a long talk with Rajendra Deshpande, who would surely help him understand what had happened. Now, what he also planned was, now with that plan of going to the library and reading the books, he had also thought that, you know what I'm going to do when I go back, eventually he would go back to Pune because that's where he used to stay. So when he would go back, he would discuss this with his friend, Rajendra Deshpande. That's your other character of the story. Who would actually make him understand what had happened. He says, yeah, I'm sure he will be able to help me out. That is... Assuming that in this world there existed someone called Rajendra Deshpande. Now because he was seeing all strange things, he says, I hope in this world which I am, Rajendra Deshpande exists because there he definitely exists in the present scenario before the accident. But in this new strange world, I hope he is there. When I go back to Pune, I hope he exists. So this is what he assumes. I hope you're getting it. The train stopped beyond the long tunnel. It was a small station called Sarhad. An Anglo-Indian in uniform went through the train checking permits. Now what happened? Who's an Anglo-Indian? of mixed British and Indian parentage. So, you know, there is an Indian marries a British, so they are like Anglo-Indian. So when they reached a small station called Sarhad, uh, an Anglo-Indian in uniform, so he came in a particular uniform, yeah, through the train, like here we have ticket collectors to come and check your tickets. So they came through checking permits, permits as in 
tickets. There was one of him. This is where the British Raj begins. You are going for the first time, I presume, Khan Sahib asked. Now, who was Khan Sahib? Another character, yet another character who was traveling with him in that train. So he tells him, now look, this person that you are seeing, this Anglo-Indian, now from here, it is the British Raj. From here, it begins. I think you are going for the first time. Suppose that something is the case on the basis of probability. He says, I guess so. So presume is like, I guess so. You're traveling for the first time. And he says, yes. The reply was factually correct. Factually as in based on facts. Now, he had been to Mumbai before. Bombay then. Okay. Mumbai now. So, he had been to Bombay several times. But to this new Bombay which he was visiting. Yes. Based on facts, it was the first time. So, he wasn't lying. He wasn't wrong. He said, yes, I am here for the first time. Gangadhar Pant had not been to this Bombay before. Right? To this new strange world. The Bombay of the new strange world. He ventured a question. Ventured as in dared to do or say something that may be considered audacious. He was not sure but he gathered all the guts and he said. And Khan Sahib, how will you go to Peshawar? He says, so they must have spoken before. And he says, how will you go to Peshawar? This train goes to the Victoria Terminus. We know VT Station, Mumbai. I will take the frontier mail tonight out of central. He says, I will go to the central. I will take the frontier mail and move on. This is how I will go. And how far does it go? By what route? He's asking him. Bombay to Delhi, then to Lahore and then Peshawar. So that's a long journey. I will reach Peshawar the day after tomorrow. Now, this was uh, the interaction between Khan Sahib and Gaitonde. Thereafter, Khan Sahib spoke a lot about his business and Gangadhar Panth was a willing listener. Willing as in prepared to do something. He was, he was okay. He was a very good listener because uh, historians have that thing. They like to keep listening, you know. So he was a very good listener. For in that way, he was able to get some flavor of life in this India that was so different. He was very curious. He said, this is a different India for me. So yeah, I would like to know more about it. And he was happy. The train now passed through the suburban rail traffic. Suburban as in belonging to an outlying district of a city. On the, the outer areas, the borders. Yeah. So it now passed from... Uh, through the suburban rail traffic, the blue carriages carried the letters GBMR on the side. Now, what was GBMR? Greater Bombay Metropolitan Railway explained Khan Sahib. He says the GBMR that you see on those blue carriages, it means Greater Bombay Metropolitan Railway. Now, metropolitan as in relating to a capital or chief city. That's the metropolitan, yeah? So, that's how uh, Khan Saib told him the GBMR means. See, the tiny Union Jack painted on each carriage. See, can you see that, you know, the tiny Union Jack which is painted uh, on each carriage? A gentle reminder that we are in British territory. Now, this should tell you, these are clues to tell you that currently you are in the British territory. The train began to slow down, dadar and stopped only at its destination, Victoria Terminus. So, beyond dadar, you know, it started gradually slowing down and finally it stopped at the destination where it was supposed to stop, Victoria Terminus. The station looked remarkably neat and clean to a surprising degree. Says, wow, the, the station is so neat and clean. The staff was mostly made up of Anglo-Indians, we said, a combination of Indian and British, and Parsis along with a handful of British officers. Now, this Bombay, this VT station which he was to get down the destination, there he realized that there are more of Anglo-Indians, there are more of Parsis and of course a handful of British officers. Why? How? Because he was in the British territory. That's the reason it was everything was so neat and clean when he got down. Yet here it was 
not only alive but flourishing the station where he reached everything was there everything was fantastic it was not only alive but developing rapidly and successfully everything that he looked around was a wow so history had taken a different turn perhaps before 1857 how and when had it happened he had to find out now being a you know he he was an expert in that subject he knew everything but because this thing was way different than what he knew he was more inquisitive he was more curious to find out what all is happening so yeah how and when how had it happened he wanted to know the details he wanted to find out he had to find out as he walked along Honbai Road, as it was called, he found a different set of shops and office buildings. Now, he saw that the road was called Honbai. It was written there. The name of the streets are generally written. And so while he was there, he, he was passing by and he saw some new shops and new office buildings and everything was different to what he had seen. There was nothing. This was completely a different scenario. There was no handloom house building. Now he had been to Bombay and he had always come across the handloom house building. But that was nowhere visible to him. Instead, there were Boots and Woolworth departmental stores imposing offices of Lloyds, Barclays and other British banks as in a typical high street of a town in England. Now, he could not see the handloom house, but instead, what did he notice? Now, because he was in that British territory, what all did he notice? Please note this down. He saw Boots and Woolworth departmental stores imposing as in grand and impressive in appearance. They were looking beautiful. Imposing offices of Lloyds, Barclays and other British banks. He could see only all different British banks around him. As in a typical high street, that means the main street of a town with most shops, banks and other businesses. Now this whole street that he was walking, it was the high street. It was just exactly the same like the high street of a town in England. Now this is how it looked to him. So he was pretty confused. He turned right along Home Street and entered Forbes building. Now he turned right and he entered the Forbes building. I wish to meet Mr. Vinay Gaitonde, please. He said to the English receptionist. Now here he asked, you know, he's asking for Mr. Vinay Gaitonde. Now who is Mr. Vinay Gaitonde? His son, Gangadhar Pan's son. He used to work there. So he's asking, I want to meet him. She's, uh, now just before I go on. So my question to you is, do you think... He is going to find his son, Mr. Vinay Gai Tonde over there. Do you think so? You're right if you have said no. Okay, it, it is a no. He Because in this world, his son does not exist. Right? So, she searched through the telephone list, the staff list, and then through the directory of employees of all the branches of the firm. She went through every list that she had. She went through the telephone list. She went through the staff list. She also went through the directory of employees of all the branches of the firm. Wherever the branches were, all the lists she went through. She shook her head and said, I am afraid. I can't find anyone of that name, either here or in any of our branches. Are you sure he works here? She says, look, I'm sorry. I'm afraid means I'm sorry to tell you that I can't find anyone of this name here. He does not work here, does he? I mean, are you sure about it that he works here with us? He's not in any of our branches. This was a blow, not totally unexpected. He's like, what? But then he expected it somewhere. Why? Because he knew whatever he was seeing, there was no handloom house. There were Everything was different. He was seeing the British banks and businesses. So he somewhere felt that maybe he, that Vinay Gaitonde, his son, does not exist there. So he was somewhere sort of prepared for this. If he himself were dead in this world, what guarantee had he that his son would be alive? He's saying, when I myself am dead in this world, I don't belong to this world. 
How do I know that my son belongs there? Indeed, he may not even have been born. He says, who knows? This is 1857 or before. Obviously, my son wasn't even born then. He thanked the girl politely and came out. He just thanked her. He says, okay, never mind. And he walked out. It was characteristic of him not to worry about where he would stay. Now, he was a very happy-go-lucky guy. He says, okay, I'll put up anywhere. I'll stay anywhere. So he did not have that worry that, oh my God, where am I going to stay? This is a new place. I don't know where, where to go, what to do. He did not, he was not that type. His main concern was to make his way to the library of the Asiatic society to solve the riddle of history. Now, currently, what was going on in his head? The priority, not where to stay, but he wanted to know where is the library, the library of the Asiatic society to solve the riddle of history. He wanted to find what riddle is going on. He was curious. He was inquisitive. Grabbing a quick lunch at a restaurant, he made his way to the town hall. He had a good lunch and he quickly made his way to the town hall. Yes, to his relief, the town hall was there. Thank God, at least that is what he, you know, was thinking of and it existed. And it did house the library. This is beautifully put up. You all should, you know, uh, check these words, the way they have been framed, these sentences. Yes, to his relief, the town hall was there and it did house the library. That means the library was there in the town hall. It's very beautifully framed. You know, when you come across chapters uh, with such good vocabulary and sentences, you all should make a note of the same and use it in your creative writings. Please do that. It will enhance the quality. So go ahead. Yeah. He entered the reading room and asked for a list of history books, including his own. Now, he had also written books because he excelled in the subject. Being a historian, he had also written books. So he asked for a list of history books, including his own. He asked for his own book also. His five volumes duly arrived on his table. Within no time, he got the books. He started from the beginning. He started right from scratch. Volume 1 took the history up to the period of Ashoka. Volume 2 up to Samudra Gupta. Volume 3 up to Muhammad Ghori. And Volume 4 up to the death of Aurangzeb. Now, you see the different errors. Yeah, he went through each and every volume. He went through each and every error to find out where is he currently? What is going on? Up to this period, history was as he knew it. Now, till here, till the death of Aurangzeb, he knew everything. So everything was fine there. The change evidently had occurred in the last volume. The very last volume, there was a certain change. Reading volume 5 from both ends inwards. From both ends, that means from the beginning and from the end, he was reading and moving inwards. Gangadhar Pant finally converged on the precise moment where history had taken a different turn. He converged as in he eventually came up to there. He finally landed up there on that, at that precise moment where history had taken a different turn. What was that? That page in the book described the battle of Panipat and it mentioned that the Marathas won it handsomely. Now, if we are well aware with uh, the battle of Panipat and if you so recall your history, here they are telling you that the Marathas had won it. And to what we know, the Marathas had lost it. Who had won it? The Mughals, right? So yeah, so here he says, now in that it was mentioned that the Marathas had won it handsomely. Abdali was routed and he was chased back to Kabul by the triumphant Maratha army led by Sadashiv Rao Bau and his nephew, the young Vishwas Rao. Now here the whole twist has come. Finally he came because he was very, uh, you know, curious to know where is this, what history is this? 
he wanted to know so now he realized that abdali was rooted as in he was defeated and caused to retreat in disorder he was chased back to kabul abdali had come from kabul he was chased he was defeated and he was asked to leave uh, by the triumphant triumphant as in the victorious the winner maratha army which was led by sadashiv rao bau and his nephew the young vishwas rao these people had driven him back the book did not go into a blow by blow account of the battle itself of course every minute detail blow by blow account as in detailed account it was not mentioned rather it elaborated in detail its consequences for the power struggle in india it elaborated as in it gave in detail in good detail it presented what the consequences the outcome the results for the power struggle in india gangadhar pant read through the account avidly avidly as in with great interest avidly okay just like you are listening to me avidly i presume the style of writing was unmistakably his it was he he had written that book unmistakably he was sure that this is what i obviously now if you've written the book you know it yet he was reading the account for the first time he says oh i wrote this but he was reading he just like felt that okay i am reading this for the first time their victory in the battle was not only a great morale booster to the marathas but it also established their supremacy in northern india now that was mentioned in the book he says the victory in the battle was not only a great morale booster as in something that boosts your self confidence that's a morale booster of the marathas because they won it but it also established their condition of being superior their supremacy in northern india the east india company which had been watching these developments from the sidelines got the message and temporarily shelved its expansionist program now what happened the east india company observed all this they saw that the marathas were you know getting the supremacy they were going on becoming superior in north india so what they did was they had been watching them from where from sidelines as in from an observer's perspective they were watching it very smartly they got that message they understood and for the time being temporarily shelved shelved as in decide to not proceed with something they stopped they were going to continue something what was that the expansionist program what is the expansionist follower of the policy of territorial or economic expansion they had program to go ahead with that but the moment they saw this they stopped they shelved it they stopped it for the time being for the peshwas the immediate result was an increase in the influence of bau sahib and vishwas rao who eventually succeeded his father in 1780 ad now what happened was for the peshwas what was the immediate result it was an increase in the influence of the uh, the influence of these two people who were they the bau uh, was bau sahib and vishwas rao their influence went on increasing and they eventually and he eventually succeeded his father in 1780 ad the trouble maker dada sahib now see it's very clearly mentioned was relegated to the background and he eventually retired from state politics he was relegated to the background as in assigned to inferior rank he was put back he was given an inferior a lesser rank and so he eventually retired from the state politics to its dismay dismay as in disappointment the east india company met its match now someone equal takkar ka you know they they came across that met its match in the new maratha ruler vishwas rao now they saw that now this guy is somewhere equal to us they met someone of the same match of the same level he and his brother madhav rao combined political acumen political acumen as in political smartness with valor valor as in great courage now what they did was they did a combination 
पॉलिटिकल एक्यूमेन एज इन स्मार्टनेस विथ वैलर दैट मीन्स विथ ग्रेट करेज दे कंबाइंड बोथ ऑफ दैम एंड सिस्टमैटिकली एक्सपैंडेड दियर इंफ्लुएंस ऑल ओवर इंडिया दे वर वेरी स्मार्ट द कंपनी वॉज रिड्यूस्ड टू पॉकेट्स ऑफ इंफ्लुएंस नियर बॉम्बे कैलकाटा एंड मद्रास just like its european rivals the portuguese and the french now pockets of influence as in small areas under control of someone they the company was reduced which company the east india company now that that influence went on reducing it was reduced to what to small areas of influence pocket of pockets of influence where near bombay calcutta and madras just like its european rivals the portuguese and the french now that went on reducing why because the influence of vishwas rao went and his and his brother madhav rao went on for political reasons the peshwas kept the puppet mughal regime alive in delhi now because of the political reasons they had some reasons so the peshwas they kept the puppet the puppet you see they were ruling like sort of thing mogal regime regime as in a particular government usually authoritarian now they kept it alive in delhi in the 19th century these de facto rulers from pune were astute enough to recognize the importance of the technological age dawning in europe now uh, i know we are going back to a little of the history but then this is a different thing so yeah we need to understand this so in the 19th century these de facto rulers as in existing while having no authority they had no authority but they were existing so these de, de facto rulers from pune were astute as in they were smart and they were quick witted enough to recognize the importance of the technological age dawning as in coming up in europe they set up their own centers for science and technology now this they realized that this is coming up right so now they set up their own centers for science and technology here the east india company saw another opportunity to extend its influence now they found this now the east india company again was very smart they were waiting for the right moment now this is where they realized they got this opportunity to extend its influence it offered aid and experts now what it did very smart now they wanted to come back to influence so what did they offer aid as in help and the people who were experts at the technology they were accepted only to make the local centers self sufficient independent needing no outside help so yes they were accepted for what only to make the local centers independent till there The 20th century brought about further changes inspired by the West. India moved to towards a democracy. By then, the Peshwas had lost their enterprise and they were gradually replaced by democratically elected bodies. Now, obviously the the there was a continuous change happening, right? Lots of occurrences of events. So when India moved towards democracy the Peshwas lost their enterprise and they were gradually replaced they were you know removed sort of and who was coming taking over democratically elected bodies the sultanate at delhi survived even this transition they were fine even then they were firm nothing happened largely because it wielded no real influence this did not really help them i mean you know did not uh, disturb them they were fine with this transition also they survived the shahanshah of delhi was no more than a figure head to rubber stamp the recommendations made by the central parliament so what they trying to tell you is the, the shahanshah of delhi then he was not just a nominal leader without any power okay just to know what is a figure head a nominal leader without any power to rubber stamp as in to approve without considering he was no longer the same the recommendations made by the central parliament they became way more smarter he was more than that as he read on 
Gangadhar Pant began to appreciate the India he had seen. He's like, wow, this India is different. Like as he was reading through the pages, he found it very interesting. It was a country that had not been subjected to slavery for the white man. It had learned to stand on its feet and knew what self-respect was. We know when British was there, how Indians were treated as slaves, weren't they? We know the entire history. But the history that he is reading right now is way different. And they are way more independent. They are no longer slaves. It had learned to stand on its own feet. And he knew, they all knew what was self-respect. From a position of strength and for purely commercial reasons, it had allowed the British to retain Bombay as the sole outpost on the subcontinent. Now, from a position of strength and for purely commercial reasons, commercial as in which is concerned with or engaged in commerce, for those reasons, it had allowed the British to retain Bombay, to stay, I mean, keep Bombay as the sole, the only outpost as in the small military camp on the subcontinent, that is large and distinguishable part of continent. Now that was there, it all had that small military camp. That lease was to expire in the year 2001. Now even that would have come to an end according to a treaty of 1908, according to an agreement between the states, according to the treaty which they had signed in 1908, this was to expire in the year 2001. Gangadhar Pant could not help comparing the country he knew with what he was witnessing around him. He couldn't stop comparing because see his mind was there that this is a different place. His mind was at two places currently though he was there in the present moment but he was in different worlds. So he could not stop comparing those two things. Right? He, but at the same time, he felt that his investigations were incomplete. He says, no, I still need to find out more. The investigations don't seem complete. He went through the books and journals before him. At last, among the books, he found one that gave him the clue. It was Bausai Banchi Bakkar. Now, he was, you remember he had called for those five books of all different volumes. Yeah. Now he went through those books and journals. Finally, at last, among the books, he found one that gave him the clue. And which was that book? Bau Saibanchi Bakar. Now this, this is in Marathi. Although he seldom relied on the Bakars, seldom as in rarely. And who are the Bakars? Historical narrative written in Marathi prose. Yeah. So he did not really rely on them for historical evidence. He found them entertaining to read. He did not trust them. He did not really believe them. But yeah, he found them entertaining. Sometimes buried in the graphic, but doctored accounts. Doctored accounts as in false accounts. Yeah, he could spot the germ of truth. A part of it being true. Germ as in a small thing, which is even not really visible. So, so beautifully put. A germ of truth. That means a part of it being true. He found one now in a three-line account of how close Vishwas Rao had come to being killed. Now, while he was reading that, he found out in a three-line account that Vishwas Rao was nearly, nearly killed. He was just about to be killed, but he got saved. And then Vishwas Rao guided his horse to the melee, melee as in a confused fight or scuffle, usually involving a huge crowd. So there was a big battle type going on and he guided his horse to the melee where the elite troops were fighting and he attacked them. And God was merciful. He was kind to him. A shot brush past his ear, even the difference of a til, you know, a sesame, safed til, they call it, would have led to his death. So basically that bullet, a shot went past his ear, just nearly brushed through. It Had it touched him, you know, it was just uh, like they're saying, a uh, thing of a till, you know, says him that far, little it would have gone, he would be dead. He had a narrow escape. 
At eight o'clock, the librarian. Now, while he was reading, he was lost. Imagine after lunch, he had sat there. It was eight o'clock. At eight o'clock, the librarian politely reminded the professor that the library was closing for the day. She's like, "Okay, the time's up. You need to move." Gangadhar Pant emerged from. He was lost in his thoughts. He was emerged and he had to come out of his thoughts. Looking around, he noticed that he was the only reader left in that magnificent hall. That big, beautiful hall. He was the only reader there. I beg your pardon, sir. May I request you to keep these books here for my use tomorrow morning? By the way, when do you open? Says, look. Can I just, uh, you know, you can you keep these books aside? I still need to read them tomorrow. What time do you open? At eight o'clock, sir. The librarian smiled. He says eight o'clock. Here was a user and researcher right after his heart. He was so close to it. As the professor left the table, he shoved some notes into his right pocket. Shoved as in he pushed some notes into his right pocket. Absent-mindedly, he also shoved the bakhar into his left pocket. Lay absent-mind, as in inattentively, he didn't do it intentionally. He did not want to do it, but he just it just happened, you know. He pushed the bakhar, that book, into his left pocket. He found a guest house to stay in and had a frugal meal, as in a very less costly, very uh, cheap sort of meal. He found a guest house to stay. He then set out for a stroll towards the Azad Maidan. Now he took his dinner. Now what? So he went on on a nice, short, leisurely walk, just doing time pass, you know, like a TP thing. Where he went towards Azad Maidan. In the maidan, in that open space, he found a throng. What's a throng? Large, densely packed crowd. Lots of people. Azad maidan. He found lots of people moving towards a pandal. We know what's a pandal. You know, a large outdoor tent that they use. Shadi ka pandal and all we say. So yeah, he was the whole crowd. The throng was moving towards a pandal. So a lecture was to take place. Somebody was going to speak. Force of habit took Professor Guy Tonde towards the pandal. Now he was a professor. He was a lecturer. So he had that habit of you know going up on the stage and talking. Yeah. So out of habit, force of habit, Professor Guy Tonde he walked towards the pandal. The lecture was in progress. Somebody was speaking, although people kept coming and going. Somebody was talking, but still people there was movement. People were coming and going. But Professor Guy Tonde was not looking at the audience. His concentration, his attention was not at the audience. He was staring at the platform as if mesmerized. He was looking at the stage, at the platform. He was totally captured. His mind, his focus was only there. The audience was not visible to him. There was a table and a chair, but the latter was unoccupied. Table and chair, there were two things. Latter means what? The chair, the later, the next one, right? The second mention. So here the second mention is a chair. The chair was unoccupied. Nobody was sitting on that chair. The presidential chair unoccupied. He says, oh, the presidential chair, the main chair is unoccupied. The sight stirred him to the depths. The sight stirred him as an emotionally moved. He was like, oh, that chair is empty. And like a piece of iron attracted to a magnet, he swiftly moved towards the chair. Just out of emotion, just some connection. He just started walking towards that chair. Finding it empty, he just started walking towards it. The speaker stopped in mid sentence too shocked to continue but the audience soon found voice the speaker was like who is this why is he coming there on the chair and he was too shocked to continue he just stopped he was in the middle of his speech he just stopped because he was shocked but the audience soon found voice as in the audience started making noise that who is this why is he sitting on that chair Vacate the chair. Vacate as an empty. Leave the chair. 
This lecture series has no chairperson. This series that we are having has no chairperson. So move from there. Away from the platform, Mr. Everyone started shouting at him. The, you know, uh, Gangadhar Pant went and sat down on the chair and people started screaming that here there is no chairperson. Just vacate that chair. Empty the chair now. The chair is symbolic. Don't you know? Symbolic as in it signifies, it is serving as a symbol. That's it. It is very symbolic that that's of a chairperson. Don't you know that? What nonsense. Whoever heard of a public lecture without a presiding dignitary? He says, what are you guys talking? How come there is a public lecture and there is no one to use that chair? There is no presiding person there, no dignitary. Professor Guy Tonde went to the mic and gave went to his views. He says, what are you guys talking? So he went towards the mic and he started speaking out his own views. Ladies and gentlemen, an unshared lecture an unshared, that means if there's no main person sitting on that chair, is like Shakespeare's Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. Now, we know the Prince of Denmark was the main hero there in case of uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet. So, it's like, do you know, it's like as good as not having Prince of Denmark in, the, in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Let me tell you, and till he could continue, the audience was in no mood to listen. He went on talking, but the audience was not ready to take what he was saying. Tell us nothing. We are sick of remarks from the chair, of the vote of thanks, of long introductions. He says, please. The public tells him, look, we don't want anything. We don't want that long vote of thanks. We don't want those introductions. We want nobody there. We only want to listen to the speaker. We abolished the old customs long ago. It says we no longer want those customs. We have stopped. We have just put away with those old customs. Keep the platform empty, please. Everyone was screaming at him that you better move away from there. You dare not be there. But Gangadhar Panth had the experience of speaking at 999 meetings and had faced the Pune audience at its most hostile. He was used to all sorts of meetings, continuous meetings, meetings with a whole lot of audience. So he kept on talking. He soon became a target for a shower of tomatoes, eggs and other objects. Now, because he was not being quiet, the public, the audience went on repeatedly telling him that you better stop. We don't want to hear you. But he went nonstop. So ultimately, the angry audience started throwing tomatoes, eggs and anything that they found, any other object. But he kept on trying valiantly, valiantly as in very bravely to correct this sacrilege as in the violation of something sacred. He said this is something sacred. You, all are, you know, you are breaking the rule there of something which is very sacred. Finally, the audience swarmed to the stage to eject him bodily, to remove him. Physically, they went to the stage to throw him out of the stage. And in the crowd, Gangadhar Panth was nowhere to be seen. That huge crowd just threw him aside. They threw him away from the stage and he was nowhere to be seen. Where was he? What happened to him? What was the consequence of what he did? Let's watch that in the next video.